Good afternoon. My name is Tim, and this is my colleague Runa. And today we're going to be talking to you about the ways to maximise performance using the new UI system that we introduced in Unity 4.6. So we've seen quite a few projects now that are using the system, and we've seen some amazing things being developed by the company. But what we're going to do now is take you through a number of best practices to achieve a UI that performs very well and works on a range of devices. So, what are the takeaways? What do we wish you to have an understanding after we finish the presentation? So, the biggest thing we wish you to take away is the knowledge of how to offer high performance UIs that work very well on Unity and scale to a large number of devices. We're also going to go through the, through the steps on how to use the new Unity Frame Debugger, which we introduced in Unity 5. Understand what batching is and how you can maximize your UI settings to take advantage of load roll calls. And finally, for people who are writing custom components, we're going to talk about how to write optimized components of your own. So, who are we? My name is Tim Cooper. I'm a developer at Unity Technologies, and I've been with the company for four years. <coughs> Before this, I used to be a graphics and core programmer um, at 2K, and I worked on such titles as Bioshock 1 and Bioshock 2. For the past two years, I've been working on the new UI system, and I will continue to do so for the moment. And I'm uh, Runa Johansson. Um, I've been a developer at Unity Technologies since uh, 2009. I've been working on various areas over the years uh, related to automation, editor tools, and workflows. And last year and a half on the new UI system. So before we, uh, before we begin talking about uh, <coughs> making a fast UI, we're just going to take you through some of the terminology around uh, batching. So what is batching? Uh, in a single frame, in every frame, uh, Unity draws uh, many meshes and the meshes are rendered in a specific order. Every mesh requires a specific state to be drawn and that depends on its material, its texture and other properties. It's like it, re it's like it uh, requires a specific brush to be drawn. If Unity needs to change to a different state in order to draw a mesh, it requires a state change. And this can be a little bit slow. If multiple meshes after each other use the same state, they can be combined into a single mesh. They can then uh, render as a single batch. We also call this a, a draw call. Uh, and it can do this because there's no state change. The process of grouping the meshes into, batch, into batches is called batching. When a mesh uses a different material or texture than the meshes that come before and after, we sometimes say that it breaks the batch. This is because uh, the meshes that could otherwise have been rendered in a single batch are broken up into multiple batches. Some state changes are slower than others. Uh, if it's, if Different meshes use the same material but a different texture, that's reasonably fast. But if they use different materials, then that is slower. Um, the slow state change uh, that comes when changing material uh, is because the shader must be changed. This is a slow process that requires uh, that the internal rendering state uh, is rebuilt. We also call the slow uh, state changes uh, that happens when the material is changed for set pass calls. In the Unity game view, uh, there's a statistics drop down where you can see both the number of batches and the number of set pass calls. When there's a set pass call, it always also generates a new batch. So the batch call will always be at least as high as the set pass calls. 
but since the set pass costs are slower, it's good to minimize it as much as possible. The faster changes are when a property like a texture is changed. In this case, the material can stay the same, and this means the internal rendering state can stay the same. All that needs to be changed are the uh, shader properties, uh, we also call them shader uniforms, they just need to be updated. So this is just uh, another draw call. In this illustration, in the top example, the middle object uses a different texture. So this requires three batches, but it can all be done in one set pass call. But in the bottom example, the middle object uses a whole different material, and this means that it requires uh, three set pass calls to render. And now, Tim will talk about uh, batching specifically in the UI system. So, Rune has covered some of the general concepts surrounding batching and what happens uh, and what must be true for batching to occur. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a closer look at what this means for the UI system. So, to start with, we're going to show an example scene. Now, this is a standard UI scene and this is one of the demo scenes we have in Unity for the UI. And this example is going to quickly show a scene without batching. As you can see, it's a standard scene consisting of uh, graphical elements and text elements. But if we have a look at the draw calls, you'll see that it takes a number of draw calls to render it. Each single item in the scene is taking a single draw call. Um, this is relatively inefficient, as it means that uh, every item is going to be using uh, resources on the render thread, as well as taking overhead to draw. If we now look at the same scene, with batching enabled. You will see that the number of draw calls is reduced. This is exactly the same scene as before, and as we scroll through the, the count, you will see that it renders in two. One for all the background images, and a second draw call for the text elements. So, what we're going to do in a moment is look at how you can get this to happen in your scenes. How does batching get calculated internally? It's based on a number of internal rules, some of which were covered, such as material changes and shared material properties like textures and other uniforms. For the UI system, we also consider element overlap. And what this means is that if elements overlap, special rules are required to know if they can match together. As we cover uh, the examples before, <coughs> you will see that it is very important to configure your projects in a way that takes advantage of this. And to do that, you need to understand your content and how it's configured. Let's take a look at visuals. Uh, but before we begin, we're going to have a quick uh, walkthrough of the Unity 5 framework. Now, this was a feature we introduced in Unity 5. And what it is, is it's a tool that allows you to step through individual draw calls. It's the easiest way to see what's getting batched in your scene, and it works right in the editor. Um, it's important to note that this isn't just for the UI system. This is a general Unity tool that works for a lot of things, but it's especially useful for the UI. Let's take a look now. So, if you go to the window menu in Unity, you'll see that there's an option called Frame Debugger. When you open this window, you'll get a Frame Debugger window appearing in your scene. And what you can do is you can click the Enable button. What this does is it lists out on the left-hand panel every draw call that exists in your scene as it currently stands. On the top bar, there is a handy little slider knob which you can use to scroll through the draw calls and see each draw call that is being issued to the graphics card. The left-hand panel is divided into a number of sections. If you look at the top, you'll see here that there's a call to camera.render. This is essentially the entry point for most rendering in Unity. Underneath this, you'll see there's a section for opaque geometry and a section for transparent geometry. 
This scene doesn't have any opaque geometry, so all you see is a call to the clearing the back buffer. If you select one of these items, you can use the keyboard to move up and down and see what's being rendered. And in the right hand panel, there is information regarding the specific draw call, such as what shader is being used, the current material uh, parameters, the number of vertices and the number of indices. We're going to be using this tool extensively to show how batching occurs in the UI when it's configured correctly. <coughs> so back to batching. The first rule for batching in the UI system is that batching happens on a per canvas basis. This means that if you have elements on one canvas and separate elements on another canvas, they will not batch together. And this includes nested canvases. By using nested canvases, it's possible to spatially divide the elements in your UI and have them batch in a separate way. Let's go through the rules of batching for the UI system. So the very first rule, which we talked about earlier, is that for elements to batch, they must use the same material and texture. Looking at this in Unity, we can see the following. We have two squares here, both using the same material and texture, and they render in one draw call, even though they are separate objects in the hierarchy. This is due to the fact that they share the same material and texture. If we modify the color of one of these, you will see that batching still happens. This is because the color is specified as a vertex color and batching can continue to work. It is not a texture or material property. To extend from this rule, it can be seen that overlapping elements that use the same material and texture can also batch. This is because when we specify the vertices and indices for the rendering, we specify them in the correct order that is required by the video card to render them in the correct order. The second rule is that batches will break when the material or texture change is required. Now, there are many situations this can occur, but let's start by going through the simple case. And that is when you have two elements that use a different material or different texture or some other properties between them differ. Unity requires separate draw calls in this situation because some internal state needs to be changed. In this example, we have a circle and a square. And if we look in the frame debugger, you will see that they do not render together. They take individual draw calls. This is because they have different textures. To extend from this rule, um, it is important to consider the cases of overlapping elements in your scene. So elements that need to be rendered in a specific order can break batching. This is because one of the elements in between them may have a different material and texture, even if the two elements themselves do not overlap. This will break a batch. Let's take a look at an example that shows this. In this example, the middle square, which is green, is using a separate material to the blue squares. If we slide the window, you'll see that they render in the specified order in the hierarchy due to the fact that the sorting knows that these elements overlap and we intentionally break a batch to preserve the correct rendering. This brings us to the next part of the UI system, which is important to understand, and that is the sorting that we use. Now, sorting is a concept that is internal to the UI system and is not directly exposed to you. Um, what it does is it considers the elements you have in your scene and looks at how they overlap. This means you can affect sorting by constructing your content in a way that is nicely that can be nicely sorted. Internally, what the sorting does is it attempts to rearrange the draw order of your elements in such a way as to achieve the minimal material changes as well as the least texture changes. Essentially what it tries to do is break the batching as little as possible while still keeping the output appearing the same. 
In this example, you can see you may have a manually specified render order, like in the top row. In a perfect scenario, Unity will attempt to rearrange this into two draw calls, one rendering all the green squares and one rendering all the red circles. It should be noted that this is a perfect example, and with real content, you probably won't achieve a situation quite as nice as this, due to elements overlapping and similar. Now, up until Unity 5.2, and that includes 5.1, 5.0, and 4.6, um, there is actually an existing bug in the system. And we're going to go through quickly what that bug currently is, and how it is fixed in the new version, because you need to be aware of this for the sorting. So in 5.2, we have a new rule, and that is that only elements that are coplanar with the canvas will sort for batching. What that means is that only elements that are correctly aligned with the canvas will sort correctly. Uh, if, this, if there is an element that is not in line with the canvas, sorting will be broken. Um, this is due to the fact that many canvases can exist in world space or perspective space and be viewed from a direct, non-orthographic perspective. Let's have a look at how this bug manifests. So here we have three items that are rendering. In the game view, they currently look like they're rendering correctly. We have two green squares and a red circle. The red circle is between the two squares. What happens though, is if we disable the 2D mode in the scene view and rotate, you'll see that the red circle is always rendering in front of the squares, even though it should not be in this situation. This is because, up until 4.2, we only consider batching in the 2D plane. As you can see here, the two squares are batching together, and then the red circle. Um, this appears correct in 2D, but if you're doing fancy 3D UIs, or world space UIs, this is incorrect. So what we do, from Unity 5.2 onwards, is if this situation is encountered, we break the sorting, and this resolves the issue. This doesn't necessarily mean we break a batch. It just means that we can't sort this element into earlier segments of the sorting. Now, depending on how you construct your content, this may or may not cost more draw calls. Here is the same scene again, with the issue fixed. As you can see, the red circle now renders correctly in between the two squares. But in this case, it does cost more draw calls, as they cannot be rendered together. So, what causes this situation where an element will break coplanarness with the canvas? Any element in your scene that just has a different depth value from the canvas will break coplanarness. Any element that is rotated outside of canvas alignment will also do this. And if you specify an input mesh where the vertices Z value is not aligned with the canvas, you will break this situation. Let's take a quick look here. It's a little bit hard to see on this monitor, unfortunately. But if you look at the, the draw call count in the friend debugger, you'll see that it's four. If we rotate this circle, you'll see that that number jumps to five, as it's not aligned with the canvas anymore. Let's undo that. And if you move this element outside of the plane alignment, the draw call count will also increase to five. If we rotate this element within the plane of the canvas, though, the draw call count remains the same. And this is because we are not breaking coplanarness. So to quickly sum up the important rules with the canvas and achieving batching, changing materials when rendering will break a batch. Changing textures will break a batch. Elements that are offset from the camera, oh sorry, offset from the canvas, sorry, will break batching, or will break sorting, and potentially break a batch, depending on how your content is constructed. So how should you apply these rules to your scenes? The first thing to do is attempt to minimize material changes in your UI. You should use materials for effects and special things in your scenes, 
but attempt to use a single material for as much of your UI as possible. In Unity 5.2, text and normal UI elements can use the same material. Uh, prior to this, whenever text was encountered, a slow state change would always happen. The next point is to try and minimize texture changes in your UI. This isn't to say don't use a bunch of textures, because you won't have a very nice UI if you don't do this. Um, the point is more to use some of the tools we have in Unity, such as sprite atlases, to achieve hack texture packing. And we'll go through this in a moment. As a side note, it's important to know that text is not currently put into a sprite atlas. What this means is that it can increase draw calls. And the final rule is to keep elements coplanar with the canvas. You can use nested canvases to help achieve this. And it's true that you, sh you shouldn't be bound to this rule though, as it's okay to move elements off the canvas, such as buttons and things that pop out, but try and make it the exception rather than something you do frequently. So let's have a look at an example of how to optimize the scene. So we've moved back to that scene that we had open before. And as you can see, if we enable the draw call debugger, we have 25 draw calls, which for a simple UI like this is quite excessive. Let's take a look at how this scene is constructed and see why it's taking so much to render. If we select the canvas, the first thing we know is that every element in the scene is actually offset from the canvas and not aligned. This breaks the third rule we talked about before, where we need elements to be coplanar with the canvas. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a nested canvas to both the gameplay window and the settings window. If we look now, the very first thing that's happened is draw calls have gone from 25 down to 13. This is because sorting is never broken. The first thing is that the text renders here, then the buttons, then the background elements. This is still not optimal though, so let's take a look at why that might be. If we zoom in on the scene, you will see that the settings window, or the settings title, is offset from the canvas. This may be something you wish to have in your scene, but I don't think it's necessarily in this example. So what we're going to do is we're going to select the two offset elements and set their offset to zero. Now if we look, the draw call count has been reduced one by one more. This is still not perfect though, as it would be nice to have all of the elements on the canvas rendered together. <coughs> Let's take a look at why that might not be happening now. If we take a look, at the label at the background here, you'll see that it's currently using a texture called SF window. If we take a look at the other element, it's using a title, uh, a texture called SF title. As we discussed earlier, this will break batching as multiple textures are required for rendering. But there's something we can do in Unity to alleviate this issue. What we can do is we can use the sprite atlas and sprite packing features. If we select these textures, You'll notice that there's a field here called packing tag. If we specify a tag for this and click apply, and then open up the sprite packing window, which is found in the window menu, <laughs> click the pack button, and you'll see that these textures have now been internally combined into one. Whilst the UI system knows that they're separate, when they're passed to the video card for rendering, they're actually passed in this one texture. This packing means the state changes are not broken. If we enter play mode now, we enable the draw call debugger, you'll see that the panel on the right renders in two draw calls. One for the text, as it currently cannot be packed into the texture, and one for the background elements, which will pack, pack together. We can do the same thing for the gameplay window, but we won't for now. I'll now pass you over to my colleague Runa, who will talk to you about uh, canvas renderers and how to achieve uh, 
nice performance in your own custom UI elements. Right. Um, so in the UI system, there's a concept, uh, a component called canvas renderer. Um, the canvas renderer is basically the graphical building blocks of the UI system. Anything you can see, like text and images, has a canvas renderer. Um, the canvas renderer holds uh, some data, like uh, the texture, uh, the mesh, and the color of a UI element. Um, and this is being used by other components, such as the text component and the image component, that uh, feeds this data to the canvas renderer in order, in order for it to be seen on the screen. So, what happens when a component modifies the properties of a canvas renderer? Um, this causes uh, rebatching. And rebatching means that the uh, Unity needs to calculate again which things can batch together. Uh, the reason that this calculation needs to be done is uh, if, a if a canvas renderer uh, is set to use a different material than it did before, then uh, maybe it can no longer batch together with other meshes that, and their materials, uh, or maybe it can. Uh, or if the texture has changed, then it's the same case. If the mess has uh, changed, then it might have a new shape. Uh, and this could mean that the element overlaps other elements uh, in a new way, and this also uh, requires repatching. Uh, the repatching is not very slow, but it's also not particularly fast either. So it's best to do it as little as possible. Another thing that can cause rebatching is if elements in the hierarchy are reordered. Um, one example of this is if UI elements uh, get a new parent object. And uh, another example is if multiple UI elements with the same parent are reordered uh, to a different sibling order. In both cases, Unity needs to iterate over all the elements uh, and then do a rebatch. And this is a slow process, so this should be avoided when it can. The good thing is that you rarely need to reorder elements in the hierarchy. One example where it does make sense is if you, for example, have different windows on the screen and you bring a new window to the front. This would require a change in the hierarchy order, but it's okay in this case because it's a one-time thing that you don't do very often. Another thing to be aware of is the setting on canvases called pixel perfect. This setting, uh, when this setting is enabled, the elements under that canvas uh, have their rectangles snapped to the boundaries between the pixels on the screen. This happens whenever a rectangle moves, and since elements that have children also move the children together with the element itself, uh, the children will also be moved and will also have their rectangles snapped to the pixel boundaries. The pixel perfect setting only works on um, the screen space canvases. That means the uh, screen space overlay and screen space camera modes. It doesn't work with world space canvases. In this example, um, first we try to have pixel perfect disabled. And you can see that the graphics move exactly together with the rectangle. But if we enable pixel perfect, then, as the rectangle is moved around, the graphics don't follow it exactly, but it's snapped to the grid that represents the pixels on the screen. When the rectangles are snapped to the uh, pixel boundaries, all the vertices need to be recalculated, and this is quite slow. So, for speed purposes, it's good to uh, limit this uh, as much as possible. 
but it's uh, mostly an issue for moving elements. If you only have some of the elements in your UI moving around while other parts are static, there's a few things you can do to improve uh, performance. You can break up your UI into multiple canvases. You can use nested canvases for this purpose and try to isolate the moving elements so they're within a, a single canvas or a few canvases. You can then disable pixel perfect on just those canvases but still have it enabled on other canvases. If your UI elements only move some of the time but not all the time, you can also disable pixel perfect just before the movement starts and enable it again after the movement stops. In the next section, we're going to talk a bit about optimizing your own custom UI components. This is uh, relevant if you are writing your own scripts that function as UI elements. So in this section, we'll go a bit into programming territory. So with the UI system, you can create your own custom UI elements. There are two primary purposes or types of your elements uh, you can create. One is to create custom graphics. Um, this could be just like we have elements uh, like image and text, you could create your own type of graphic. And this is basically any component that will control a canvas renderer. You might also create a component that uh, controls layout in a custom way. And this is basically any component that controls the rig transforms. Optimization in this context means that the layout and graphics should only be rebuilt when needed. There's a concept called canvas element, which is um, something in the UI that can be rebuilt. And any custom UI element can be a canvas element if it imp implements the interface called iCanvas can element. This interface has a few different methods you need to implement, but the most important one is the one called rebuild, that is called when some parts of your calculation should be run to rebuild. The rebuild method has a canvas update enum value. Uh, that specifies which callback is currently invoked. And this can have a few different values. For layout, there's pre-layout, layout, and post-layout values. And for graphics, there's uh, pre-render and late pre-render. Pre-layout is used if you need some calculations to happen before the auto-layout system uh, is run. And the layout event is mostly used by the auto layout system itself. While the post layout event, uh, you can use that if you re rely, if you have calculations that rely on the layout already having been calculated, so that all the rig transforms have the correct values. For graphics, you will normally use the pre-render event. Uh, this is where you calculate all the vertices and textures and materials uh, for the graphics. In rare cases, you can also use late pre-render. This is needed if your graphical element rely on being able to read the vertices of some other UI element. In the UI system, we use uh, this for the input field, which needs to access to the vertices of the text in order to know where the cursor, the blinking cursor, should. So what controls when these rebuild methods are being invoked? This is a class called Canvas Update Registry. And there's two methods that can be called in this class. Uh, canvas, register canvas element for layout rebuild. Uh, when that is called, it will invoke the layout related callbacks. And when register canvas element for graphic rebuild is called, it will invoke the rendering related The callbacks don't happen immediately with the, when these methods are called. They are delayed, um, and also there could be multiple uh, places in scripts 
that trigger the same rebuild, but this doesn't mean that the calculations will happen multiple times. They, they only happen once, and it's designed this way in order to avoid unnecessary duplication of the same calculations. If we look at the update loop in Unity, um, right now in uh, the current versions of Unity, it's a little bit inconsistent when the callbacks happen, but from Unity 5.2 onwards, it will always happen just after the late update call. So, what should trigger which kinds of rebuilds? We want the rebuilds to happen uh, often enough uh, when they're needed, because if uh, something changes but a uh, rebuild doesn't happen, it will look like uh, the element is lagging behind, uh, and it can look like buggy or incorrect behavior. But we also don't want the rebuilds to happen too often, because then it will, uh, then the performance will suffer. So, in your own custom component, you probably have various properties that affect the appearance of layout. If a property on your component is changed, that requires vertices or materials to be changed, then you need to call a register canvas element for graphic rebuild. An example of su such properties could be a color change, a sprite change, uh, anything else that affects appearance. If a property change in your component that affects the layout, uh, so basically the position or size of a brick transform, then there's a few different uh, things you can do. If it's a very simple uh, change, like for example you have a slider and the slider value is changed, and you need the slider not to move as a result, then you can just change the red transform directly. If it's something a bit more involved, maybe something part of the virtual layout system, uh, like a layout group uh, component, then it's better to use a higher level API that comes with the UI system that's called Layout Rebuilder. This API will uh, call layout specific events uh, that are called on the right, you are elements in the right order in order to make sure all the cal calculations uh, are done correctly. You can also call uh, register canvas element for layer rebuild on the canvas of the registry directly, but this is uh, a, a rare case. This could, for example, be if you are writing your own layout system as a replacement for the one that comes with the UI system. There are other things than property changes on your own custom component that may also need to trigger rebuilds. For example, maybe you have animation that can change the position or size of a red transform. In this case, we have some callbacks that you can implement in order to detect this and trigger a rebuild. There's a callback you can implement called unred transform dimensions change. Uh, that is called when the red transform does change size and position. There's also callbacks related to when the order in hierarchy have changed. Uh, these are untransformed parent change and untransformed children change. The latter one of those uh, is particularly useful if you are creating a type of layout group that might need to change the layout depending on properties in the children. If your UI element uh, needs to look different depending on whether it's interactable or not, uh, then you might also want to implement on canvas group change. This uh, is invoked if there is a canvas group uh, high up in the hierarchy and it has its interactable property change. So, by doing a rebuild in this case, you can trigger the control to look like it's active or inactive based on, on this value. Now, you don't need to necessarily implement all these things yourself. Depending on which type of your element you're creating, 
you can maybe take a shortcut by inheriting from one of the base classes that come together with the UI system. If you are creating some type of graphical element, you can inherit from the class that is called graphic. And if you're creating some type of interactive control that the user can manipulate, then you can inherit from the class called selectable. And if you're implementing some type of layout group that controls the layout of itself and children, then you can uh, inherit from the class called layout group. These base classes implement many of the callbacks we already talked about, and instead they, uh, they have methods you can override and do the specific graphical or layout calculations. Um, instead, uh, and this can uh, reduce the work you need to do in order to uh, have the rebuilds be triggered uh, at the right times. Hi, so we've covered a number of things here in this talk. We've talked about uh, optimization from a content point of view and configuring your scenes to take advantage of batching. Um, and we also talked about the best ways to get performance out of your UIs. Now, we went through some tools earlier, such as the Unity Frame Debugger and the Sprite Packer. These tools are documented in the Unity documentation, but if you search for them in your favorite search engines, they should be the first results. Um, there's a lot of information there with regards to getting your sprites packed correctly and using the Frame Debugger to optimize your scenes. And we recommend using these wherever possible, especially the Sprite Packer because it allows you to reduce the draw calls in your scenes, in your UIs, by a very large amount. Uh, a final point to make is that the UI source code is open source and available on the Unity Bitbucket repository site. Um, if you're curious about how we do things in our custom controls, such as our buttons and selectables and graphics, please uh, go there and get the source code and have a look. And um, thank you. That's Now, do we have time for questions or not? Yes or no? We, I think we'll take a few questions if uh, anyone has anything to ask right now. We have uh, someone on the front left. You want to say? We just need to get our headphones. Um, and we're going to be extending this in the future to allow for particle systems as well. 
but as it currently stands, um, we know this feature is like in the main main room. Yeah. Um, uh, just an addition about the product system. Uh, you can use a normal Shuriken product system together with the UI. Um, it can be a chart to break transforms, uh, and by setting the by setting the sorting sorting layer and sorting order in. I've got the exact property names, but but the canvas has properties for controlling the depth, and the particle system has as well. And in this way, you can control approximately in which order the UI elements and the particles should render in relation to each other. Next question. Uh, if there's no more questions, thank you.